will now call our May 8th Kittle Hills Board of Commissioners meeting to order. If you would please rise and for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> we head into a moment of silence. Um, <coughs> first, our assistant finance director's husband, um, Charlene is our assistant finance director. He had some recent surgery, um, is doing well, but um, still has a road to recovery. So if you'll keep um, Charlene and her husband in your thoughts and prayers. Um, our Jennifer Stetcher, who works in our police department, her mother passed away last Tuesday. Um, and a friend of mine, resident of Kildable Hills, um, Katisha Bryant, her 24-year-old brother passed away last Tuesday. It's a rough, rough day. Um, and some of you may remember um, Commissioner Jeff Finch. He passed away at the end of April, um, but they held a memorial service for him up in Culpeper, Virginia this past Friday. Um, he and his wife, Marilyn, had moved to um, Locust Grove, Virginia, in the last year, but we um, <laughs> wanted to extend our, our thoughts to all of these families um, in, in their time of grief, and um, our well wishes are with all of them. And with that, I would ask that uh, you all join us for a moment of silence, please. Thank you very much. So welcome. We have lots of um, new faces in the room with us tonight. So um, welcome to all of you. If this is your first Kittleby Hills Board of Commissioners meeting, hopefully you will find it enjoyable. And we're happy um, to see a lot of the youth in the audience and look forward to some presentations and, and awards this evening. But first up, we will have our agenda approval. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, thank you. Um, we'll move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the first time set aside this evening for public comment. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board on any item of their choosing. We do ask if you're speaking during public comment, if you're speaking as an individual, that you limit your comments to three minutes. And if you're speaking on behalf of a group, you would keep those comments to five minutes. When you um, wish to speak, if you'll just raise your hand if you haven't already signed up on the list, and we'll call you to the podium. And if you'll just identify yourself by name and address, please. So we'll start. If, if anyone signed up on the public comment speaking list, it's okay if you didn't, then we'll call from the floor. So no one signed up ahead of time, which is fine. Is there anyone who wishes to speak at this public comment time? <coughs> anyone? Okay. No worries. We have another time set aside later on the agenda if you so choose. So we'll move right into um, the next item, which is introductions and presentations. <coughs> and the first item we have is the Trash Attack Poster Awards. And our chairwoman for the um, trash attack is Miss Sandy Marklin, and she will be here to present with Chris Merrick the award. So welcome both of you, and while you're coming up, well, um, thank you so much for the First up, I'd, I'd like to say that this year was a very successful year for trash attack. We actually collected 21 cubic yards of trash and an additional two tons of garbage uh, bulk waste. So it's the best year since our return to trash attack and we're thankful for everyone's support of us in this effort. Um, we have a poster contest. Hopefully everyone got a chance to look at the posters that were submitted this year. These are the six best or the five best. Um, and tonight we will announce the order that they were judged, and they were judged by the executive director of the Dare County Arts Council. Um, our first honorable mention goes to Miss Sophie Yacobi. Yeah. 
Congratulations, honey. Thank you. Um, which one of those is yours? One gets your special. Okay. <laughs> that was excellent. That was my personal favorite. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Our next honorable mention goes to Miss Jenna Moxley. Is Jenna here? Hi, Jenna. Hi. Which poster is yours, Jenna? Uh, the one in the top right corner. Oh, that one's great. Awesome. I love the colors. That's for you. Okay. Thank you so much. Third place was taken by Lucy Stetcher, uh, who could not be with us this evening. Is Ellen McCall here? Come on up, Ellen. Ellen, you got second place. Which one is yours? Well, it's the one on the bottom left corner. With the bird and the yeah. cigarette? Yeah. That's excellent. There you go. How's that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Congratulations. First place this year goes to Miss Jill O'Dell. Come on up, Jill. And this is this is Jill's poster, which can also be seen on that flashy trash truck out front in case you missed it. <laughs> but these are the clings that are made from the, the winning poster contest <laughs> entries for all the town and all the visitors to see. There you Thank go. You. Thank you so much. Each one of the contestants will receive gift cards, but those will come to our contestants in the mail. So you have another surprise coming. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. And this is an annual uh, event that's hosted not only the Trash Attack, but the Poster Contest. So um, be look out on the lookout for it again next year, and if you didn't submit, We'd love more submissions as well. But thank you so much to all the students who took the time to do artwork this year. Um, as you can see, it's just it's a great way to help us get the message across that we're trying to do. So thank you again. Next, under introductions and presentations, uh, we have the Cape Hatteras National Seashore Superintendent, Dave Halleck, with us this evening. Welcome. Thank you. Dave has a presentation for us on events going on throughout the Outer Banks with um, our parks. So welcome again. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the opportunity to be with all of you and give a little bit of an update on what we call the Outer Banks Group, which are the three parks that I have the pleasure of managing. I'm going to give you a quick update on some things that are happening in your backyard here across the street. Uh, talk a little bit just about the parks in general, and then tell you a little bit about Cape Hatteras National Seashore. We are, we've recently made some changes, particularly when it relates to access on the beaches. And then I'm happy to answer any questions or give you updates on anything else you're interested in. Uh, I think you're probably all familiar with this, although I'll tell you, I've worked at other parks before where most of my neighbors had never even been to the park that I worked at just down the street. So just in case, the Outer Banks Group is comprised of three different parks. In the upper right-hand corner, you see Wright Brothers National Memorial, which of course is here in Kildevil Hills. We've got Fort Raleigh National Historic Site in the lower right-hand corner. It's the location of the first English colony in the U.S. You notice I didn't have to describe to you what Wright Brothers was about. And then on the left-hand side is Cape Hatteras National Seashore. It's the first national seashore. It's in both Dare and Hyde counties. It's about 70 miles long on three islands, including Body Island, Hatteras Island, and then Ocracoke Island. So uh, just a quick primer on these three park units. Last year, we had 3.2 million visits. That's a lot of visitors for a National Park Service unit. And most of those visitors are staying here for a long period of time, according to Dare County's data, probably four to five days on average. A park like Glacier National Park has this type of visitation, although those visitors are not there as long. So uh, if we were a national park, we would probably in the top, be in the top 10 in terms of visitation. But you can see the breakdown. The seashore gets about 2.4 million. Fort Raleigh gets... Uh, just under 300,000, and Wright Brothers typically almost uh, almost a half a million visits. We've got about 82 year-round staff. We hire about 100 seasonal staff each year. This year will be about 115, 
and we have uh, usually a couple hundred, almost 300 volunteers. We've got four campgrounds. Last year, 1.6 million uh, visitors visited our five visitor centers. We had 65,000 overnight camping stays. The one closest to all of us here, of course, is down at Oregon Inlet across from the fishing center. By the way, the fishing center is a park service operation. It's managed by a concessionaire uh, that manages that charter fishing uh, fleet with 57 boats. Last year, we sold 36,000 off-road vehicle permits. As far as I can tell, we have more off-road vehicle activity at Cape Hatteras Seashore probably than any place in North America. We have over 200 toilets, two water treatment plants, a lot of septic systems, parking lots, 230 buildings, and three airstrips, including the one across the street. And uh, we, we manage all this off a budget that's just under $15 million. Congress has been generous to give us about $9.5 million to operate every year, and then we make up the rest through fees. The only fee park for entry is across the street at Wright Brothers, but we also charge at our campgrounds and for lighthouse climbs. Uh, I wanted to point out, this is data, these are data from Cape Hatteras National Seashore. Last summer was the highest level of visitation at Cape Hatteras National Seashore in 13 years. Um, so quite a banner year. We're not exactly sure. 2016 was the centennial of the National Park Service. The degree to which that was a driver versus fuel prices or the economy is, is really hard to say. Um, so some updates about uh, this wonderful park we have across the street, Wright Brothers National Memorial. Uh, just a reminder for all of you, every year we've been celebrating with the First Flight Society, which is a partner organization, National Aviation Day. We plan to do that again on August 19th. We had 4,000 people come for National Aviation Day. We've partnered with Dare County, the Tourism Bureau, uh, uh, NASA. Uh, we had hundreds and hundreds of uh, thousands of children that came and a lot of activities for children as well. A great flyover and uh, a great partnership also with NASA Langley Research Center. It's their centennial this year, so we'll be helping them celebrate that event. So please come out and, and see us, and if, if KDH has any interest in, in partnering for the event, we're always interested in bringing in more partners. So this is a photograph of the Wright Brothers National Memorial Visitor Center taken in 1960, right after it was completed. You can see the newly planted shrubs there. And here's actually a very artsy looking photograph two years later <coughs> of the Visitor Center. Um, despite maybe some of the oddities that you might uh, believe in when it comes to the Visitor Center, the Visitor Center was actually designated a National Historic Landmark. Uh, in 2000, and that gives it the highest level of historic preservation of any federal building. And it was given that uh, that special designation based on the, fast, the fact that it was constructed during an era of construction in the Park Service called Mission 66, and this is considered a, a unique and stellar example of a visitor center in the Park Service that was constructed in 1960. So it's an old visitor center over 50 years old, it was time for a renovation. So excuse our dust across the street right now, but we're in the process of renovating the visitor center and all the exhibits. Altogether, this is almost a $7 million project. Everything in the visitor center, the, uh, the, the water pipes, the electrical, was all original. Even the rebar that reinforces the concrete was rusting and, and splitting the concrete. The roof is being redone. All of the windows are being replaced a brand new uh, geothermal cooling system is being put in the ground. So it's a pretty big project. In addition, all of the exhibits, which are original exhibits, are being redone. So we expect this project to be completed in August of 2018. We'll have a big uh, ribbon cutting or some other type of an event, and we'd love to invite all of you to be part of that. We're very excited about the new visitor center. Okay, so now some just quick updates on what's happening at Cape Hatteras National Seashore. We had, had a huge amount of interest over access and beach driving. Uh, maybe I'll dispel some myths tonight, maybe not. Maybe I'll tell you some good news about uh, what's happened over the last couple years. The bottom line is when it comes to driving at the seashore, you need a permit. Here's a picture of one right here. And our sales for permits, which went in place in into place beginning in 2012 have just been going up, up, up. Last year we had a record sales uh, level for permits with over 36,400 permits being sold. This just gives you an idea that 
driving on the beach at Cape Hatteras Seashore is extremely popular and the popularity seems to be growing. Because of that, we have a management program that I'll talk about in a few moments. We started a new system where you can buy your driving permit at home online and print it at home and never have to come to one of our offices. And since we've done that, we've doubled our online sales. Uh, another just quick update about what's happening down on Hatteras Island. Uh, there's a beach nourishment project going on, it seems, everywhere these days. This project is slated to start around the end of this month and continue through the end of, of August. 2.6 million cubic yards of sand pumped from the uh, three jetties, the old lighthouse site on the southern end of Buxton, and ending on the north end at the Hallover Day Use Area, sometimes referred to as Canadian Hole. So going back to uh, beach driving, uh, we've changed some of the wildlife protection buffers we have. You may know that we have imperiled species of wildlife that nest on the seashore, including sea turtles and piping <coughs> plovers. And over the last couple of years, we've modified those buffers. We made them smaller, <coughs> and we gave ourselves the ability to improve the ability to, to use corridors in front of some of the nests, in particular sea turtle nests. And I'll talk in a few minutes about what the difference has resulted in. Uh, we also put a number of new access projects into place. We built new ramps, including ramp 25, 32, 49, 63 on Ocracoke, a four-mile long road, uh, and raised some ramps that were um, being affected by flooding. And this year we'll be raising ramp 4, which is in South Nags Head here. So we've basically completed all of the construction access projects for off-road vehicles on the seashore, and now we're implementing a whole bunch of pedestrian projects. The Coquina Beach... Uh, handicapped accessible boardwalk uh, was just completed and uh, we're looking at a variety of other improvements as we head south. As I mentioned before, the seashore was originally carved up out of the 67 miles into 28 miles of off-road vehicle routes, 13 miles of seasonal routes, just like in Kill Devil Hills you can't drive during the summertime, same thing on Hatteras Island in front of the villages, and then 26 miles of areas where you can do anything you want, you just can't drive. And then we periodically close these areas to protect uh, wildlife. So we made a whole bunch of changes, and a lot of these changes went into a place in January. The first one is we opened some of our popular driving ramps now at 6 in the morning and later in the summer at 6.30 versus 7. So that gives you another hour or half hour of, of time to get out on the beach early in the morning uh, and gives us time to protect sea turtle and bird nests. We also changed our seasonal routes, probably approached something that's more similar to what we have here in Kill Devil Hills. Before we changed uh, the rule here, uh, you could drive on the beaches in front of the villages on Hatteras Island from November 1st to March 31st. We extended that season by a month with two additional weeks in the fall and two in the spring. We changed our zoning a little bit as well. Uh, a year ago, we had 28 miles of off-road vehicle routes. Now we have 29. We had 13 miles of seasonal routes, now we have 15 and a half, and 26 miles of vehicle free areas where you cannot drive, and now we have 22 and a half. Um, this was a little bit of a recalibration based on Congress's request to the National Park Service. And uh, what it effectively means, of course, is during the uh, fall, winter, and spring that there's almost 45 miles of beaches that can be driven on, and during the summertime there's up to 29. We have a permit. Our permit is, uh, before we made some of these changes, was $50 for a weekly permit and $120 for a calendar year permit. And what that meant is if you bought your permit today for the year, it was the same price as December 1st, even though you only got uh, just a few weeks of use out of it. We changed our permit, so now our weeklies become a 10-day. Our annual permit is 365 days of validity from the date of purchase, and the price stayed the same. So is there a difference on all these access changes I just described? The answer is absolutely. During the summer of 2013 and 14, we had between 17 and just under 20 miles of beaches open for driving between May and September. 2015 was the year that we began to make these changes, and it was a year in flux. But last year, with all the changes I described, we had on average 25 and a half miles out of 28 miles open for driving between May and September. So a lot of big changes when it comes to access on the ground. That's all I have for you. Happy to take any questions that you have or talk about any other topics you're interested in. Questions for Dave? I have a question. Is there any chance of, that the monument will be 
able to be open to the public again, or is that the the monument itself? Yes. Uh, yes, there is. We have a. Uh, the monument is also very old, even older than the visitor center, and we have a water intrusion problem, a fairly significant one. Uh, originally, I believe it was built with a gutter system in between the external wall and the internal wall where water flows down. A lot of the piping that was part of that system is corroded and uh, no longer functional, so we have a significant problem with water coming in the monument. We're, we've done a lot of, um, uh, it's all just like arthroscopic surgery. Cameras, flexible cameras going in everywhere trying to trying to diagnose what the problems are. We have a better sense of what's happening, but it's, it's not totally, um, we, we haven't figured it out quite yet. Uh, most likely on August uh, 19th, Aviation Day, we'll have the base of the monument open. And we try to open it periodically, but it's not open all the time. We really need to fix the uh, drainage problems we have. There's often pools of water on the floor, not from rain, just from condensation and the change in temperature and humidity. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, Dave. Uh, over the years, it seems to me that the number of planes in the flyover in December is diminished. Is that, uh, am I correct in that assumption? And it's because... Yeah, good, good question, Mike. I think you are correct. I, I've only been in this position for about two and a half years, so I haven't, I didn't have the chance to see all the other flyovers. The First Flight Society, uh, which is a friends group or a dedicated fundraising organization for Wright Brothers, uh, is the group that helps to organize the flyover. And what they've found basically is that a lot of the um, uh, military uh, participants that used to participate uh, just because of budgets and timing and staffing are just not able to anymore. So that's what I've heard. I suspect that it might be a money issue. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here this evening and sharing this information. Um, I appreciate, we, Dave and I have had the chance to chat on, on numerous occasions, and um, I appreciate the relationship that we have with the Park Service and your willingness to, to be an engaged partner with us and likewise us with you. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm happy to come back as often as you like with updates or, or uh, partner with any of you on, on anything we can. So we, we also very much appreciate the invitation and the strong partnership. Yeah, by the way, Dave, any of you don't know, Dave attends virtually all of our um, tourism board meetings. And we get a briefing there, too, which is really nice to keep us up to date. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Our third item this evening under introductions and presentations is a student presentation. These are students from First Light High School um, and sharing a project with us about making a difference, recycling at the beach. So welcome, ladies. Thank you for having us today. So, so my name is Madison Delcalo. I'm Carrietta Clausen. I'm Caitlin Nicholson. And I'm Kristen Applebaum. And like you stated, we are students, actually sophomores, from First Light High School in Adam Herman's civics class. And our project is Recycling at the Beach. Our summary of our proposal is, we have come up with the idea to add a little pop of color to our benches, beaches. Well, we had to mess up at least <laughs> once here, so. Um, beaches with painted recycling cans at the beach, accesses, and Kill Level Hills. We decided to go off the decorated trash can idea from a while back. We will have good quality decorated recycling cans, replacing the old ones and adding character to the new ones by students from First Light High School's art classes. To, uh, these recycling bins, our goal is to help clean up the beach and surrounding area to help decrease pollution and help with the wildlife. This will get students involved in the community in a positive way that will impact their growing character and the community. It will add fun color to the beach, which will help <coughs> more people to recycle their trash instead of just throwing it away. And it will result in an overall less pollution and safer environment for both tourists and the wildlife. The payments start with replacing the old recycling bins and um, the Rubbermaid 50 gallon recycling bins are 
and even though it's kind of expensive, they will last a long time because they're not the other colors. So. Um, here's the website at Home Depot. And the curbside recycling in Kilo Hills costs $7.82 per month. The community effort is the high school art students and the alpha schools in the county will paint the recycling cans as a project and they would make them fun and colorful to grab people's attention so they'll notice them. And the effects are is it will promote recycling in our community. The increase in recycling, especially on the beach, will have a huge positive impact on the natural environment and a unique addition creating an increase in interest in non -locals. In conclusion, this will be worth our time and money to make our beaches unique, creating a positive effect on keeping our community clean and our popularity high. It will be something people will enjoy seeing. It will also show that our community is interested in making our town a clean space for everyone to enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you referenced the at the beginning. You referenced the trash can project that was done a number of years back, and I recall seeing those. In fact, I think there's still a few at Parks and Rec. They're starting to fade a little bit now, but they were very eye-catching, especially when they first came out, very bright and colorful. And, um, do you recall how that project got started? Maybe. I believe. I believe it was another group of students like us that spoke to the town and, and that, I don't, I, mean, I think that's not that started. Yeah. The group of students. Mm -hmm. Another project like this. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you for your time and thank you for thinking of this idea and um, certainly also thank you for coming and speaking. Uh, you did a great job. I know sometimes it's a little nerve-wracking to get up in front of a board and speak, but you can be proud of yourselves. You did great and uh, we appreciate it. Okay, so we will move on now then to new business item number one. It's the land use plan update and report and recommendations. Is it going to be Meredith? Welcome, Meredith. Thank you. It's okay. If you guys did want to leave, it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's totally perfect. <laughs> Have a good night. Bye-bye. You the house. <laughs> I told him to run. I didn't think they'd take me seriously. Good evening. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the update to the land use plan. The board um, requested desire to get the land use plan updated um, since the 2007 survey was done. Since 2007, the land use plan regulations have changed and it's become much easier to update your land use plan. Um, it's eliminated several items that were previously required, including the public opinion survey. But um, staff has recognized that the board desires to receive uh, public input on, on several issues and recommends that the 2000 survey questions be revamped, um, renewed, updated, and then the survey be put out online. I think it'll reach more people by being put online. Um, we'll be able to reach not just homeowners when we mail surveys, it's mailed to homeowners, but we can get the people that live in Kill Double Hills and rent in Kill Double Hills and work in Kill Double Hills not just the people that own property in Kill Double Hills. So I think it will uh, broaden our reach and get a, a better updated opinion on several issues that are, are of interest to the board. Um, to update the land use plan, staff would recommend that we uh, develop a request for proposals for a professional consultant. This will allow us to update the land use plan in accordance with the general statutes that are developed by the Division of Coastal Management, and it will make the process a lot easier and quicker, um, and the result will be a, a better land use plan in the end. Um, funding options, there's basically two funding options available. One is a Division of Coastal Management grant. 
Um, we've missed the deadline for the 2017-18 year. The first we would be able to apply would be next March for an 18-19 funding source. Um, and speaking to the district planner, Charlotte Owens, with the Division of Coastal Management, that money may or may not be available in 18-19. Um, it is a federally funded grant, and um, the federal um, budget is very uncertain at this time, and, and a lot of the environmental um, funding is uh, up, up for grabs, I guess. And uh, so that may or may not be a funding source. The other option, of course, is for the town to fund the land use plan, and that, that option would allow for the project to begin in the very near future, basically as soon as we get an RFQ done and the survey is complete. Um, I have put in my memo a list of timeline for, for this to be done. Um, if we would update the survey questions and bring it for final approval to the board at some sometime in June, um, the survey online, we would do an enhanced online survey, which would allow for the statistical data to be done with the survey instead of the staff doing that data. That would be about $500 for the uh, online survey. It also allows controls for not being able to do the survey over and over on the same IP address and things like that. Um, we would release the survey in June uh, once the questions were approved by the board. We would let it uh, let it for three to four weeks, depending on how long the board desired. Um, and we would also be working on the request for proposals at the same time. Um, try to release requests for proposals in July. Um, give a month for those to come in and maybe bring a consultant recommendation to the board in early September of 2017. Once that's done, a land use plan takes approximately a year and costs between fifty and sixty thousand dollars. And I'll answer any questions you might have. Uh, who does the question update? Is that us? The the staff would the planning staff would do the updates. But bring um, we, them to you for your approval. Yes, right. Of course. And we're looking at the two thousand seven questions, and uh, I've spoken with a few of you. We would revamp or update those questions to be relevant to some of the issues of today that may have changed over time. And then there were some questions that were clearly weren't written well, um, that our results were very muddled, and we would try to either fix it or eliminate um, those unclear questions so that we could have a, a nice, concise, and hopefully clear understanding of the public opinion. You anticipate it'll be shorter than the ones in the past that were mailed, Con condensed in a way. I know in the past we sometimes sort of intentionally asked the same question in different ways to try to get people's true feelings. That I just wonder if it's going to be. It could be as long or as short as the board wants, but we would recommend that questions be asked um, multiple ways in different sections so that you're sure that the person who's taking the survey understood the first time, and there's a cons you can consistently show an opinion throughout uh, in, in different variations of the same question. I talked to Meredith earlier today, and I, I asked her if there was going to be um, a mailing sent out to alert people that there's something online, like a, just a postcard, something simple, and she reminded me how old I am by saying people under 35 don't mail anything back so well, I, I i i didn't tell him he was old i promise what i did say was that the the millennial generation really doesn't use mail and if, if we mail them something it, it it likely won't come back um and to broaden our demographic i think the online would be a good source we will we can and will if the board desires have paper copies of the surveys for those who would prefer and staff will be have the ability to enter survey results if someone would prefer a paper copy we can surely provide that um but i think that you'll get a a broader uh, demographic from the online one last question uh in the past, I think we've had a response uh, from the surveys the last two times, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 
17 or 18 or 19 percent. Um, I don't know um, a whole lot about this, these kind of things, but from all of it, thank you for reminding me. Um, would, would you anticipate a higher percentage? It's going to be a little bit different. We'll be looking at numbers of surveys filled out versus how many we sent out and got back. So we'll be able to sort of gauge it with how many we sent out and got back versus how many we've gotten filled out online. And um, we might be able to do a percentage, but it's a very different process because if we know we sent 8,331 out and we got this many back, that's an easy, it's an easy math problem. But when you're doing it online, you're sending it out to anybody. Um, so we would, we would garner how many responses we got and, and make that part of our, um, you know, decision-making processes. Okay, maybe, I'm <clears throat> sorry, one more thing. Uh, when I mentioned the thing about sending out a postcard or something to somebody, and you said you probably weren't going to do that, basically, but, and I asked you how people are going to be notified, and... You made a very good point that there's social media, there's Facebook, there's our website, there's local Outer Banks community websites, and uh, there's many different ways to get the information out there to people so that they know there's a survey there to take. And Dare County was successful in doing that about three or four years ago. Um, they were very successful by using the newspapers, the radios, the online um, surveys, I mean, uh, sources to try to get garner public input. Nag said was also successful with it in their development of Dowdy Park. Um, they used an online survey and they used multiple media sources to let the public know that there was a survey and that we wanted public input because it was going to, you know, help develop a park that the people wanted. And I think that, you know, if you've been by Dowdy's Park and looked at how many cars are there, they were successful. And, and we can also um, help the Tom Center because we, we, we deal with, with the public and a lot of the citizens, the older citizens in the population, I think that you're, you may be talking about, the, the, the non-millennials um, <coughs> partake of our services and we can put it in our newsletter as well as some of our social media because we do have some that are techno savvy. And, but we do have some that don't don't have computers and don't do that kind of thing. And we have some that are homebound and that, that, that don't get out. But we we have ways of reaching them. We, we've got people who visit, you know, homebound people and do, do things like that. So that we, we have ways of reaching those folks. So um, we, can, we can do that as well. So I guess um, as far as tonight, we're looking at wanting to move the process forward. I do think when we when you come back and have the questions for us to review, I think also we may engage in a little bit of, it's a philosophical switch a little bit in doing this, which I'm supportive of the online because I think we're, we're going to broaden our reach. But it will be the first time that we're broadening our reach, and there's not going to be a way to say it's only someone that's living here in Philip Hills. We'd have a difficult time doing that. You ask you can ask that question. You can ask the question. We will ask the question. Right. And you can we can even ask where in Kittle Hills, but I don't know that we would be able to unless, you know, they enter a fictitious address that we would know that. But anyway, I think it, it's just something that we'll we can discuss further. But I don't think that should slow up what what I appreciate you've put together is an efficient timeline. And if if, if the survey process. comes back and we're finding that the results are not good because they're skewed somehow or it, it's it's nobody that lives here or something like that we can always backtrack call east carolina get their survey institute to help us do a paper one but i think that for the cost of doing this online survey and and the success that i've seen lately with online surveys that i think that we you know may get the results that we want but we can always we can always say if, if we feel like that they're skewed or, or inaccurate or um, we're not getting the people that we want or we're not getting reaching the demographic we want, we can always go back to the paper. My question was going to be on the validation as well and how you do that because I did the one for Survey Monkey they used, the many eggs they used for Dowdy Park and it asked, but there was no. 
Well, on the paper one, you can lie to. Well, <laughs> but you'd have to get it. No, we had them available. You could come by and pick it up. It was also sent on the Sunshine List. It was it was it was available everywhere. It was at the Bottom Center. It was at the Dare County Rec Park. It was it was everywhere. Anybody could pick it up. So, as far as um, guidance tonight, uh, would there be consensus to move forward with the timeline that Meredith has proposed, or? Um, Meredith has proposed in her memo to Debbie that's attached in the packet. Are we in agreement with that? I'm, I'm good with it. I had, had a question just because of the well, later in our topic is the budget. As long as this doesn't put too much on you guys that's between now and June. So, I mean, that's a it's that's going to be a lot to potentially do, but I'm good with it otherwise. Well, the, the only thing we would be talking about um, cash-wise at this point would be the survey itself but in the $500 range, and the expert fine with that. No, I, I, well, not that. I think the potential for increased workload while we're also going through the budget. That was my only, my only concern. Okay. Good. Okay. Unless we throw them a lot of curveballs at a budget yeah. workshop, I think the bulk of the work's probably been done. So okay. it's nice have, to be mindful they, of. They haven't asked so. us yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Don't want to get too comfortable. That's right. <laughs> okay, so we're good with moving forward then. Thanks, Great. Mayor. Thanks for that. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, the next item under new business is the request for signal light at Avalon Drive in US 158 and examination of timing sequencing at Neptune Drive and US 158 in connection with Ocean Acres Drive and US 158. Um, and if you guys recall, we had received an email um, from Ms. Living Good requesting uh, us to look into that. She actually had contacted NCDOT and they advised that the process is for this board to discuss and make a beneficial request if the board chooses to do so. And at the same time, we were discussing adding this to tonight's agenda at our last meeting. Commissioner, Commissioner Appleman brought up, well, let's have them look at these other um, signal issues as well. So that's how we got to where we are this evening. So I'm just going to open the floor for discussion and comments. So question one. Actually drove around that area a couple times this past week just to kind of get a feel for traffic, and it it definitely is some interesting issues going through there. Um, would we? I know one of the thoughts was potentially to make that no longer a one-way street, but have it have the direction go both directions, traffic go both directions. Is that would that be a requirement for a light if it's if it's coming out on the one fifty eight? Or we don't know until they come back. That's, that's East Avenue you're speaking, right? It's not a very long street. It's not. <coughs> they would certainly look at all of, all of those issues in, in their study. Sportsman's one way as well. Sure, on which site for social media um, that this was going to be on the agenda this evening, and even though Miss Livingood is the one who sent the email, there were a number of um, KBH residents that had posted that were very pleased that we were going to discuss this, and were also echoing their hope that something could be done. Yeah, going back a few years, when we requested the <clears throat> state that uh, lower the speed limits. And they did lower them from uh, around, uh, around Wright Brothers on south to around where her next at uh, elementary school is. And since this came up, and, and you mentioned Neptune, uh, I, I, I wondered back then why they didn't extend that 45 north through that really busy area. Uh, Kmart and the theater and Belk Center and Mint and all those lows and then it's going to be a public supermarket. And when you get up even further between uh, our town line down to, um, I guess it's landing, there's uh, 16 intersections. And most of them are close together. They're just like two lots apart. You know, so you have here and here and then houses. So there's 
a lot of uh, potential up there for problems. Does anybody feel like maybe we should maybe ask them if they want to extend that 45 northward to a point either to the town line or at least maybe get above Avalon, which is just almost to the town line anyway. Their, their reasoning before was that it was going to potentially slow up traffic. I'm wondering if we did that plus a light between 5th and Helga, if that would maybe complicate things. You know, a light might break up traffic enough on its own, even though I don't like traffic lights without having brown belts. I was kind of curious if we could maybe take the Neptune light make Neptune one way and take that traffic light and move it down to Avalon. But then I don't know what the logistics are in moving traffic lights. But the one at Neptune is, I think, way too close to <coughs> Ocean Acres. And I've seen the traffic light change from green to red at Neptune, back to green, and then red almost immediately. It's like I don't, I don't understand why it happens. I've, never been able to work it out, but I do think there's kind of a major issue or a problem with the Neptune intersection. You made a good point. The light would slow people down getting to it and they'd be slower going away from it, so that would take care of part of that. In that area. It's in the middle of the stretch. And I'm definitely in favor of lights forward. I hate to add that and then have it derail anything that we can do. But if we add one more thing and then yeah. never mind. <laughs> Good to bring it up for a healthy discussion. That's right. Um so um, it seems like there's consensus then to ask officially ask M C D O T to look at to at least look at it, yes. Study Absolutely. this, come back to us with options. Yeah, maybe they can Item number three, then, moving on and under new business, is an appointment for the Dander Dangerous Animal Appeals Board. This is for the seat currently held by Sue Kelly, whose term expires this June 2017. Sue has expressed a desire to be reappointed. Uh, with that, I'd like to make a motion that we reappoint Sue. I'll second it. Discussion, sorry. <laughs> Any discussion? Comments on that? All those in favor, please signal by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, and now item number four under new business is the presentation of the town manager's recommended budget. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, you all should have at your places the, um, the recommended 2017 18 budget and the plan year for 18 19. Um, in accordance with general statutes, the governing board shall adopt a budget ordinance not earlier than 10 days after the budget is presented to the board and not later than um, July 1st. The, um, and previously, the, um, well, the board will need to hold a public hearing um, on the budget that's presented to you this evening. And the hearing may be held at any time after the presentation, either before or after your work session. Generally, um, you've conducted your work session prior to the public hearing, and if that's your desire, then we'd recommend that at your next um, meeting in May that we have the budget work session, and then would request that you would set the public hearing for Monday, June 20th, 2017 at 5.30. And a motion would be in order to schedule both the work session and the budget public hearing. Um, the work session would be the 24th? Um, That's your proposal. Yes, sir. If that, if that is, in fact, and I understand there may be a request to change that meeting, so that's why I worded it that way. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, our grandson is, uh, and his team are in the World Finals for the Odyssey of the Mind in Lansing, Michigan that, that week. Uh, it actually say, takes place starting on uh, Thursday, and my wife and I would like to go. We have to leave on Tuesday. Of course, we would 
probably come back the following Sunday. But I looked at the calendar and it could be if it's if there's uh, <coughs> if it's okay with the board, we could either move it to the 22nd, which is Monday before, and we would leave the next day, uh, or uh, not the 29th because that's Memorial Day, but either Tuesday the 30th or Wednesday the 31st. I wouldn't want to, I would try not to miss the workshop. So what we're looking at is our next meeting, which was supposed to be the 24th. Having that as our budget workshop. And if we needed more time, we can also, we can always schedule another one after that. Um, but due to a, a conflict, I'm going to see then if we can adjust that date instead of being the 24th. Does anyone have their calendar there? Yeah. I will be out of town for on the 22nd that weekend okay. for a graduation uh, out of state. Um, but I, I can I could do the 30th, 31st if that works. Okay. What about, I think I have a conflict on the 30th. What about the 31st? Can everybody do the 31st? Yep. Well, that's wonderful. <laughs> so if the 24th meeting goes to the that would be Right. We would move that back one week then to the 31st. And that would be our budget workshop. And then any other business that we need to schedule that evening for a regular meeting. Okay. So then. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. That's great. You can squeeze that in. That would be worth doing for sure. Congratulations to your grandson. You guys brains from... Um, Sue, because I still have mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, we will need a motion then to schedule the budget work session for Wednesday, May 31st at 5.30 and schedule the budget public hearing for Monday, June 12th at 5.30. Mayor, if I may, and, mm -hmm. and the motion that you're scheduling the um, budget work session, if that motion would also include moving the meeting date from May 24th to the um, 31st. I think that's what I said. <laughs> yes. Okay. I think that's what I said, right? Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, no. I was thinking, so it, it's, the motion is both. It's, it's scheduling, I see what you're saying. So even though I said scheduling the work session, but it's actually moving the May 24th yes, meeting, which that would way be we the, can cancel it. And exactly. Move it. Yes. Okay, so that, the clarification then. Got it. Okay. So would someone like to make that motion, please? I'll make the motion to move the May 24th meeting to May 31st and schedule the budget workshop for that meeting. Yes. And what about the, would you also like to include the, the um, scheduling the public hearing? On? Yeah, scheduling the public hearing June 12th. 20. 12. 12. 12. 12. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Secret motion that Mary can give anyone credit. Really, my notes are wrong. Okay. <laughs> Michael, thank you for the motion. I'll second that. <laughs> I'll second. Any other discussion? Are we crystal clear? <laughs> yes. Great. Okay. All those in favor, please signal saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you. Okay. I'll well, adjust our calendars accordingly. Okay. With that, then, we will move on to your commissioner's agenda. Commissioner Midget. Okay. Commissioner Appleman? Okay. Your person? What? Okay. <laughs> Do you have any agenda this evening? You don't? I have an agenda. An agenda for this evening? Do you have anything? No, no. Oh. No, I'm sorry. Okay. Then we are. <laughs> Why are you saying on me? I'm going down the line. <laughs> you are next. I know. <laughs> okay. Mine was somewhere else for a second. All right, we're going to move on to the mayor's <laughs> agenda. Um, in your packet, there's a couple items this evening. Uh, the first is a proclamation designating May 15, 2017 as Peace Officers Memorial Day and May 14th through the 20th as Police Week. Um, it, as stated in the memo, each year it's estimated that 140 to 160 officers are killed in the line of duty each year. Um, and we know we've felt that um, close to home a number of years ago. Um, so with this, I think it's um, appropriate for the board to adopt this present, excuse me, proclamation um, 
and um, we're asking the public to honor the, the role that the police officers make in our, in our communities. So, with that, a motion to adopt the proclamation would be in order. So moved. I'll second. And discussion? All those in favor, please sign up saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. The next item is under Mayor's Agenda, item number B, is a resolution opposing the sales tax redistribution. Um, currently, there's Senate Bill 126 and a partner bill, House Bill 522, that would change the adjustment factors applied to the half-cent half local um, sales tax levy. In the packet, along with um, the resolution of opposition. It also includes the chart about what the potential impact if this legislation is enacted would do. Um, it's estimated specifically for the town of Kittleville Hills, we would see a $242,000 annual um, loss in revenue from um, the change in that formula for distribution. So obviously, this would not be a good thing for our town. Every county, excuse me, every town in uh, Dare County would lose under this this change in formula. So, with that, I uh, recommend we adopt this resolution opposing the sales tax redistribution. I'll we'll second it. Okay, so discussion? All those in favor, please signal saying aye. 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 <clears throat> Any opposed? Thank you. Okay, next item, we will move on to the town manager's agenda. No, ma'am. We'll then move to the town attorney's agenda. Yes, may have two items tonight, actually. Um, the first, uh, seeking instruction from you who are wiser than I. Um, we were we had a recent town attorney meeting, uh, maybe in February, right? Is that February? And uh, there were a couple items that uh, the planning department brought forward, uh, so far as our town code and, and the possibility of needing amendments to the town code. And, uh, there were just some items that weren't very clear, so. Uh, I wrote a memo to the UNC School of Government, who's always, yeah, they've got a pleasure of advice and a wealth of knowledge there. Um, and uh, the one, one issue in particular uh, was, was a, the right or the authority, what rights and authority does a municipality actually have to go in and unilaterally or without court order abate a nuisance? In other words, if we've got complaints coming in from homeowners and, you know, it, it's a, it's a scenario where some, some action needs to be taken. Can, can the town go out if the homeowner refuses to do it in a certain, or landowner refuses to do it in a certain amount of time? Can the town take action without court intervention? And um, essentially, I, I kind of need to break it down into, into two scenarios. We discovered that we were correct in a chronic violator scenario. So that being a scenario where somebody receives three notices within one calendar year of the same nuisance violation. We are allowed so long as we take action within that year, okay, so it's got to be the same year that the three notices are given, the town is actually allowed without court order, and this is by state statute, to go in, abate those nuisances, any funds that we use to go in and take care of the, uh, you know, the, the, those multiple complaint scenarios can be assessed against the property owner as a tax lien. So that's one scenario. And, and that was good clarity, and, and we thought that to be the case, but it's always nice to have somebody else vindicate and back that up. So what I'm, what I'm here to discuss tonight, however, is Chapter 93.04, uh, entitled Abatement by the Town. It, it falls under the Nuisances Statute. And uh, currently, that statute reads, if the owner of any premises on which a public nuisance is determined to exist, having been ordered to abate such nuisance, fails, neglects, or refuses to obey or remove the condition constituting the nuisance within 15 days from receipt of such notice, the town manager shall cause the condition to be removed or otherwise remedied or abated. Now, in reading that, <laughs> there's really no clarity there. In other words, who's ordering what? I mean, is it our order? Do we have to go to court? What, what's, the, what's the fine line there? How do we decide that? So what came back from the School of Government, essentially, is... is Kind of what I expected is this sliding scale test. So, according to uh, GS 168-193, we can, in, in any scenario, whether it be a chronic violator scenario or not, we can go in and take action to abate nuisances on our own without the court telling us we can do so. 
only, however, if it qualifies as being dangerous or prejudicial to public health or safety. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that puts us in the scenario where we're now the decision makers. It's in our discretion. So we're, we're taking chances, essentially, and we're potentially infringing on people's property rights and, and, and things of that nature. So, you know, dilapidated homes and things of that nature come to mind when you think about something that's prejudicial to health. If, if, if we got a home border and a public sidewalk or something like that, and it's a, or the street, and it's going to fall in if we don't do something, okay, that's a little different. However, yeah, ordinarily we're not going to be faced with that scenario. So my advice really, I, what I think we should do, and this is where we need instruction, but I, I think we need to revise uh, chapter 93.04. Um, the abatement scenario, to essentially, to erase, to, to get us out of the decision-making scenario, to put it in the hands of our local courts, which is a very accessible um, resource. I mean, to not subject us to liability so we don't end up as one of those fancy towns in the Supreme Court who've infringed, and now we're up there defending that, you know, let's, let's, let's revise the, this statute to say, um, again, court orders required. So we need to take the steps necessary in a standard nuisance scenario, one that doesn't qualify as a chronic violator, that court action would be, would be required before we could actually take abatement steps. That, that would be my recommendation. And um, if that's something that, that you, know, you guys feel is as necessary, then we can take that. And I'll also answer any questions before the motion. I think my only concern in hearing that is um, I think the concern that was raised by a citizen before that brought this to the table during our public forum mm -hmm. was the timeliness. Uh, right. And in, in this particular case, it was um, a house that had been <coughs> substantially damaged in a fire, uninhabitable, and they um, took, I think the concern is that it wasn't secured well, right. or yes. the windows yes. not covered, or, 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 windows. or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just recently was actually totally torn down, and wow. now there's no issue whatsoever, which is great. But it, I don't know, two years of a process maybe that, that it took. And I don't know that it wasn't, I think months went by before we were asked to get involved and, and realize where it was. But I think that was the, the concern is how timely can we respond if we're going to go through and, and do a court order. Right. Okay. And with that, the other thing I thought is, going back to the three notices in action within mm -hmm. a year, mm -hmm. what is that timeline in between notices? Do we have that defined, or would that help to maybe make it more? Um, do we have that defined in our, is that in our nuisance policy? Or what, uh, to, to, the uh, chronic Casey, violator. Casey, scenario. correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I understand chronic violators, <coughs> it is a person that has a violation remedies it, has the same violation, remedies it, has the same violation, remedies it. Um, it's not an ongoing right. so violation. So if they never remedy it? If they never remedy it, it's an ongoing violation, and what Casey's recommending is that we get a court order to abate it, and and maybe the, that needs to be quicker than we've been doing it. I mean, we've waited a certain amount of time to give people time to do it themselves to be, you know, work with people and, and try to understand the, because a lot of people that have these violations are in a, a fairly severe amount of hardship. And, um, you know, so at, at our department always tried to work with the, the homeowner to make sure it was secure and safe. Mm -hmm. And the specific location that you're, that the person talked about, it was unsecured. And every time that they were in violation, they secured it. It was becoming unsecure because people were getting in it. And as soon as we notified them, because they didn't live here, that it was unsecured, it was secured again. <coughs> um, so they did have an issue at that specific house, but um, typically we try to work with a homeowner um, to allow them time to do it before we start you know, putting liens on their property and, and, and the town going in and doing it. That process can start a lot sooner if that's a desire of the board, um, we'll just look through your direction. And, and I, I think it would just be a, a, a more, as Meredith said, you certainly want to work with them. And nobody Absolutely. wants to take anybody to court if we don't have to. I mean, that's something that goes without saying. However, um, from, a, from a timeliness aspect, uh, outlook, you know, I, I think a, a proactive approach from the town could, could really bolster that. Mm -hmm. 
think we could we could um, again if if we take action soon enough, we could prevent those scenarios that you were just saying and drug out for for two years. Well, and I think it's important for anyone that either in the audience or folks that may be watching this later. Um, Meredith, you brought up a good point. I know often people don't want to call the town because they feel like they're complaining, or I don't want them to think I'm whining again. But in this case, it's a great example that they weren't they weren't in the area, so the homeowners wouldn't know until we notified them, and we wouldn't know until we heard it from people living nearby the house. After the second time, we started actually monitoring it fairly closely, and we're much more proactive in, in notifying the, the owner immediately. The story behind that house, that house was just wrapped in, in just bad. There's a lot of factors in that. Juju. Juju. Right. Well, unfortunately, that, that owner had fell on, not only did the house burn down, but then family crisis after family crisis. It was, it was very difficult for her, and uh, we tried to work with her as much as we could. And she was responsive when we called. And she was trying to get it torn down almost the entire time. So I get, do you want me to just leave it in motion? Um, I think. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Is it, is it a calendar year? Does yes. Revive? Okay. Yes. yes. Defined as calendar year. That was another question that popped up, and we looked into that as well. So it would be calendar year. So. To answer yes, I mean, an example would be if, if it pops up in August and they remedy, and then October it's back. But the next violation, we don't find until January if they're outside. So you're correct. So get a hold of them. Any other? So it's not a 365 Correct. That, that, that's the, that's my interpretation of what, what, what the school of governor was, was saying. Any other questions? All right, so something to this nature then, with a motion would be in order to simply uh, request that town staff present a text amendment of uh, chapter 93.04 uh, to the Board of Commissioners for consideration to, to clarify the need for court action on the abatement of nuisances. Anyone like to make that motion? I'll make the motion as, as suggested. Is there a second? I'll second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please stick on saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Very thorough. Thank you. Um, and now, uh, on another motion, this is one that I'll make. Um, we would. Uh, I'm going to make a motion at this point for the Board of Commissioners to enter closed session pursuant to NCGS 143-3.18.1183 to consult with counsel for the town in a manner that preserves the attorney-client privilege and for the purpose of giving instruction on a potential judicial action. Second. Okay. So there's a motion and a second. Is, uh, one second. Just looking at a parliamentary procedure here. <laughs> That's, yeah. yeah, okay. I think what we'll do just to make sure that um, yeah, that we're not out of any rules of order. Robert rules. Yeah, I, let's respect Robert. Um, I <laughs> will make the motion that you stated, but it's the motion um, for our board to enter into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11A3 to consult with our attorney um, for the town of matter, preserving the attorney-client privilege for the purpose of giving instruction on a potential judicial action. So I'll make the motion. Is there a second? Any discussion? All those in favor, please sit or saying aye. Aye. We are going to enter into closed session for just a few minutes. Hang tight. We'll be back as soon as possible. We will return from our closed session, and I will ask our attorney to make a statement. Please. Uh, the board, uh, town attorney, town manager, Town Clerk, uh, we did call in the Planning Director and, uh, and the Assistant Police Chief. Went into closed session. Um, we went in pursuant to NCGS 143-318.11A3 as required of our general statutes. And essentially, uh, we were preserving attorney client privilege there, and we discussed uh, the need, uh, potentially, for, for judicial action. Okay. Any other discussion? Any other 
Thank, Thank you. you. All right, we will move on then and pick back up with our agenda. Um, we are now on to the consent agenda. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, three items on the consent agenda this evening. The um, approval of the minutes from the April 10th and April 26, 2017 Board of Commissioners meeting. The second is um, scheduled public hearing. This is a requested um, amendment for Chapter 153 zoning, building height limits, requesting um, that you schedule this public hearing for June 12th at 5.30. Um, approval of the consent agenda will record the scheduling of this public hearing as recommended. And lastly, um, beach nourishment planning and sand fencing. We have received qualifications from interested landscaper professionals for the dune planning and the sand fencing that will be in conjunction with our beach um, the nourishment project. Um, one company, Coastal Transplants, is a standout of considerable experience in beach nourishment projects in North Carolina. And approval of the consent agenda will authorize staff to negotiate a contract with Coastal um, Transplants to be executed after June 30th, so it will be in the new fiscal year. Um, Funding for this portion of the Beach Nourishment Project will be available in the Capital Reserve Fund, and further action will be recommended at a future meeting. Staff recommends approval of the consent agenda as presented in a motion would be in order. Uh, we need an RFQ for that, or we can pick somebody? Um, she, we've done that. Oh, you have? We received the, the um, request for qualifications have been received. Oh, I, yeah. I'm used to seeing the initials. <laughs> Yeah, I got you. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there a motion, a motion on the consent agenda? So moved. Okay. motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, any discussion? Comments? All those in favor, please say no saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, for those of you who have hung in with us, we are now at the second time set aside this evening for public comment. Is there anyone who wishes to speak this evening? Matt, welcome. How do you think it is? Um, <laughs> I, uh, I didn't realize there was all the trash attack stuff going on and the recycling stuff. And then, of course, Dave Howard was here talking about beach access. So on behalf of the Surfrider Foundation, I just want to say thanks to you all for doing the trash attack, to all the participants. I guess we should have done this in the front side when they were here, but it was really cool to see all this effort to keep the beach clean and, uh, and the recycling. And, of course, you know, um, a lot of times it can be at odds, the whole Surfrider mission statement with environment and access. And that was, you know, it was great to see, in fact, in the whole comments leading up to the, the whole debate, it was like, how can we find a way to get these to work? So to see this kind of come around, and that's the whole, that's the whole thing personally. Um, it's just great to see that come out. So thanks y'all for all your support. And October we'll do the beach sweep again. And I think October, that's a lot. This year it's going to be in uh, conjunction with Surf Alors, which is the end of September. So we'll do, I don't know the dates. It's one of those, I think it's the Saturday. We'll do it that day. So we'll do our usual. Thanks for coming out. Enjoy. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for all you guys do. Yeah. Thanks, bud. Yeah. Is there anyone else that would like to speak at this public comment time? Okay. Anything from the board? And I saw she was passing, showing you these. If anyone wants to get a stack of these or a few of these, these are stickers. Um, help KDH kick back. Um, a great way to spread the message in kind of a fun, lighthearted way. So, um, about picking up cigarette butts and that throwing cigarette butts out is not that was um, legitimate. That was inspired by the winning poster. The poster. Yeah, mm -hmm. these are great. So, if you would like one of these to put on your anything, we have them. So, please do. All right. Anyone else have anything for this evening? If not, a motion to adjourn would be in order. So moved. I'll second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please signal by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for sticking with us this evening. <laughs>